So again, we talked about the dendrites. So the three parts are dendrites. So if you had to um, talk about the three parts, you would say dendrites, the three parts, dendrite, cell body, and um, axon. These are the three main parts of the um, components. So dendrites, they receive um, signals from other cells. Cell body organizes and keeps the cell functional. So they have all the organelles that we typically need uh, in the cell body. The cell membrane will protect the cell. You know, all, all cells have this. Oh, thank you for sharing the Yannick. The axon hillock generates the impulse in the neuron. The, these are just nodes. So what do you guys think the nodes of Ranvir are? Um, if you see that this blue is the myelin sheath. Uh, the gaps in the between each one sheath. Yeah, that's like the points of the axon that are not um that, that are not like covered by myelin sheets. So whenever you have the sheet, it's almost like these are the stops that you would make. And if you're going on a local train, a local train makes stops everywhere. So if you're here then you would be making a stop here, 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 here. You're making stops everywhere. But with an express train with the myelin sheet, you can send it here and here and here and here. It'll just keep jumping and it moves so much faster than going at each point. That's also why in certain diseases where um, the myelin sheath is impacted, so it increases the speed of the signal. It can be really difficult for people to have like in multiple sclerosis as well, where these myelin sheets are being attacked. It can be difficult for signals to spread. And that's sort of what we, we get older. There's something that's called demyelination or demyelinating diseases where the myelin sheets of the, of the neurons are impacted and the signals take even longer and people like are, move slower. They, they, you know, stuff takes a long time. They're a lot slower. So right now you guys are at your cognitive peak. So you're going to be in your twenties soon. Like your everything is working and it's working fine. We're at our peak performance. So does anybody, so, so these things are uh, allowed because they're letting the action potential spread and there are these spots here. Action, axon terminal will connect to the dendrites of the next neuron. Um, so the nucleus of the DNA and everything here. So this axon hillock, if there is enough of a signal, this is almost like the back of the camel. If there is enough signal, then and only then will an action potential spread along here. Otherwise, nothing happens. So here, we're going to talk about any questions on that so far, but we'll come back and revisit that when we talk more about action potentials. Okay, so the nervous system contains hundreds of different types of neurons that have physical forms that are specialized for their functions. So the three main types of neurons that we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on sensory neurons, we're going to look at motor neurons, and then we're going to look at interneurons. So they're all, so it's, I showed you the recipe. So uh, basically a neuron has um, a cell body, dendrites and an axon, but their shapes can be different. And that's also something we'll have you guys look at today is how we have so many different cells in our body and they do different types of things here. Maybe I could actually, let's see if I can get there. Let me get there. Um, So in terms, we, we can see, for instance, like um, in the, the egg cell, pancreas, muscle, heart, blood, brain, bone, liver, kidney, we can see that we have enterocytes, hematids, leukocytes, white blood cells. 
We have neurons, bone cells. We have so many different types. We have muscle tissue cells. We have so many types of cells and we have the same DNA in each cell. So I just wanted you guys to see that. Um, yeah, I have some, some, some problems for us to work out together too. Let me just go back up here. Um, okay, so uh, that's why I'm trying to show you that we have different types of neurons as well. We have, um, oh yeah, and we'll check, uh, we'll check out your, I'll check out your video in a, in a few moments. I'm Yannick, thank you for sharing it. So sensory neurons transmit signals from the sense organs about touch, sights, sounds, tastes, and smells. So these are the, the three major types of neurons we're talking about. So you can think of your skin. And that must have been in that video we were watching about this dendrite, this cute, I think he's adorable. Uh, when we were watching how when the guy was touching popcorn, thinking it's a cookie, how there might have been a sensory neuron that's telling him, oh, wait, 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 that's uh, the touch. You're not touching, uh, that touch is, that touch is like, like, you know, very, like, it feels like it's popcorn, not, not like a cookie. So we have five sense organs, you know, the five um, organ, you know, eyes, ears, nose, tongues, skin. If you want to sound super fancy, you can use these terms I put here in parentheses. We have sight, we've got hearing, we've got smell, we've got taste, we've got touch. So these are the receptors here. This is like the dendrite, they're receiving information. The cell body, this has all like the nucleus and all the other organelles. Like a cell typically has all the organelles like mitochondria, endoplasm, reticulum, ribosome, Golgi apparatus, all these things they have inside them. But so that's called the cell body. Um, then we have this axon. Okay. Um, And then we have this axon here. This is, um, these are sensories. And then it's going to be talking to an interneuron. So these sense organs have receptors that send information to sensory neurons. So these are necessary spots in, in the nervous system that receive these from sensory neurons. Then we have these motor neurons. So these motor neurons are when found in the spinal cord, they are part of the central nervous system. So do you guys remember what the central nervous system has? What is central? Mm -hmm. uh, the brain and the spinal cord. Yes, awesome. And anytime you forget it, just think of central as like, what is a central thing that comes to mind? Well, it's a brain. And then if you're thinking of the brain, you're thinking of the spinal cord. And peripheral, all the other nerves and you know everything else, you know the periphery, everything else. So motor neurons, um, they connect to muscles, glands, and organs in the body. They transmit impulses from the spinal cord to skeletal and smooth muscles. So we even have smooth muscles in our stomach that are responsible for digestion. So normally messages or signals from nerve cells in the, upper, uh, in the brain, which are the upper motor neurons, they're transmitted to nerve cells um, in the brainstem and spinal cord, which are low, lower motor neurons, and then from them to muscles in the body. So the upper motor neurons direct the lower motor neurons to produce muscle movements. So this is myelin axis. So this is again the dendrites, then the cell body with all the organelles in the nucleus axon, and which has a myelin sheaths. And some neurons don't have it. It really depends on, on their functions, but, but, but if they have it, it improves. And this is um, the axon terminal. This is a newer muscular uh, junction and a muscle fiber. So they help control all our muscle movements, like skeletal muscle activity, like walking, breathing, speaking, swallowing, like all those things. In fact, I, don't, I wonder if, how many of you guys have heard of Stephen Hawking before? Awesome. And if not on the Big Bang TV, oh yeah, I can see a lot of you guys on the Big Bang TV, you probably see that Sheldon is a huge fan of Stephen Hawking because it's super cute. So does anybody know what he had? What disease? I know the name of disease in Polish, but not in English. So I'm kind of useless now. Oh, <laughs> maybe uh, I guess I'll show this to you. So this is um, seven years ago. Have you guys heard of the ice water bucket challenge before? You guys might have been super young. 
like when people would take ice water and dunk it. So this is called, he yeah. had Lou Gehrig's disease. Okay, cool. Which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So back in the day, uh, this was me. I don't know. I was, uh, I would, I just, the super, my friends dared me to a challenge on um, an ALS. So he had ALS, which is a motor neuron disease. So what I want to talk about is why these motor neurons are super important. And when you have like, um, when you have problems with motor neurons, motor neuron diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis (ALS), which is what Stephen Hawking had, you will you go you could it, your life would be very painful. And um, here, this is I just wanted to show a short little clip. This is me in August 2014 doing the ice water bucket challenge. So I was a little nervous. A friend's dared me to it. Hello there, I'm Sonia Kuller, and I would like to thank Melissa J for nominating me for the ALS challenge. Now ALS is amyotrophic lateral um, sclerosis and it's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease or as motor neuron um, disease and it basically means no muscle nourishment. Now here you will see um, some nerve cells. This is a nerve cell of a normal um, of a person who does not have ALS and this is the nerve cell of a person who has ALS and you can see that there's muscle atrophy because ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Now you have um, to spread awareness for ALS and join me on this mission. I will directly nominate um, Siddhi Sunder. Ah. I have I, um, some ice, so I'm going to put the ice in the water. There's ice water, and have yes. I me on now as I do this? One, two, and hey! Ah, uh, that was me doing the ice, uh, ice water bucket challenge. So I was like uh, putting some ice water there. So that's me doing the challenge. I like how other challenges are just like people pouring water and you just started to explain things about narrants and other stuff. This is very typical. Uh, I like <laughs> uh, thank you, Yannick. Yeah, I was like really, um, I tried to dare my uh, little bro, but he, he was like, no, no, no. He's like, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I was like, um, I was the yeah I was nominated by a friend and I wanted to spread awareness about it. So um, it's the ALS ice water bucket challenge. It was an activity. Thanks, Yannick. Involving pouring a bucket of ice water over a person's head, either by another person or self-administered, to promote awareness of the disease. ALS. So it's a motor neuron disease. It's also called Lou Gehrig's disease. You can just call it ALS. Um, and it's trying to encourage people to donate to research, to spread awareness. So it's a challenge as well. So you have to nominate. So people typically pour this ice water on them. It was huge. So what is this exactly? So Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, it's progressive muscle weakness. So a nervous system disease that weakens muscles and impacts physical function. In this disease, nerve cells break down, which reduces functionality in the muscles they supply. The cause is unknown. So that's something that's ongoing research and you guys could be part of the cure, like finding the cure for these. And it's all about looking for innovative ways. Like the approach that Jonathan and I talked about yesterday, if we have problems with it, we're not saying we're right or we're wrong. And it was great. Like Alex had a, had a critical eye, which is good. A lot of people in a good way, because we maybe we're, we need to think about our methodology or how we're going about answering these problems. And um, we're going to also talk about a, a very cool problem that uh, was using um, artificial intelligence to figure out the shape of proteins. Um, and these are things that we are trying, whether it's through bench lab biology or whether it's through artificial intelligence, any way that we can solve and answer these questions, we're trying to do that. Um, so you can see here that, you know, in, in all of these things that motor neurons are doing, speak, speaking, swallowing, walking, grasping objects, moving, breathing. So it's very sad. I think Stephen Hawking was an exception because typically two to five years is the average life expectancy. 
and 10% and of cases are inherited through a mutated gene. We'll talk about those. So this is a lot of money. And this is the cost to develop a drug to stop or slow the progression. And 90% of cases occur without family history. That means that you may just be like, everybody's looking at you. So if 10% are inherited through a mutated gene, so you see the word inherited, that means that it can come from your parents, um, biological parents, then the remaining 90% might just come from nowhere. And what these are is these are, um, forget the term, let me slip my mind. Um, these are like random mutations. I, I'm having a brief, but these are random mutations that are introduced and um, you have to figure, and they're not inherited as well. They happen in your gametes, you know, um, when they're being formed. So um, these are just random mutations. And right now, every 90 minutes, so I think we've had our class has been, yeah, 90 minutes so far of class. So in that time on average, this is an average, someone has been diagnosed and, and um, someone has passed away from ALS, which is very heartbreaking. And as of now, there's no cure, but maybe you could be one of those people who helps guide us in that direction. I don't think any of us um, in a humble way will be able to address these, but if our work can help other people, it's, I think it's all about teamwork. So what, when I was showing my diagram as well, you can see that the nervous system, they have motor neurons, which is a type of nerve cell type of neuron. Healthy motor neurons stimulate muscles to contract. Um, and what we were seeing here is this neuron is, is, um, is when the action potential, when it is triggered, um, then the signal passes along the axon, then it's triggering the muscle cells to do something. It's attached, the axon is attached directly to these muscle fibers here. But in, um, but, it, but here, so it's typically stimulates muscles to contract, but in a dead motor neuron, ALS kills motor neurons, causes muscles to weaken and eventually paralyze. So I want to show, so they're extremely important, you know, like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So that's Stephen Hawking. So let's watch this video on ALS and why it's so hard to cure. Ah, eeks. In 1963, a 21-year-old physicist named Stephen Hawking was diagnosed with a rare neuromuscular disorder called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Gradually, he lost the ability to walk, use his hands, move his face, and even swallow. But throughout it all, he retained his incredible intellect, and in the more than 50 years that followed, Hawking became one of history's most accomplished and famous physicists. However, his condition went uncured, and he passed away in 2018 at the age of 76. Pretty Decades long lifespan. after his diagnosis, ALS still ranks as one of the most complex, mysterious, and devastating diseases to affect humankind. Also called motor neuron disease and Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS affects about two out of every 100,000 people worldwide. When a person has ALS, their motor neurons, the cells responsible for all voluntary muscle control in the body. So you, you can see that this is, these are the axon terminals, right, connected to muscles. Lose function and die. No one knows exactly why or how these cells die, and that's part of what makes ALS so hard to treat. In about 90% of cases, the disease arises suddenly, with no apparent cause. The remaining 10% of cases are hereditary, where a mother or father with ALS passes on a mutated gene to their child. The symptoms typically first appear after age 40, but in some rare cases, like Hawking's, ALS starts earlier in life. Hawking's case was also a medical marvel because of how long he lived with ALS. After diagnosis, most people with the disease live between two to five years before ALS leads to respiratory problems that usually cause death. What wasn't unusual in Hawking's case was that his ability to learn, think, and perceive with his senses remained intact. Sensory Most nuance. people with ALS do not experience impaired cognition. 
sensory neurons are still intact. With so much at stake for the 120,000 people who are diagnosed with ALS annually, curing the disease has become one of our most important scientific and medical challenges. Despite the many unknowns, we do have some insight into how ALS impacts the neuromuscular system. ALS affects two types of nerve cells called the upper and lower motor neurons. In a healthy body, the upper motor neurons, which sit in the brain's cortex, transmit messages from the brain to the lower motor neurons, situated in the spinal cord. Those neurons then transmit the message into muscle fibers, which contract or relax in response, resulting in motion. Every voluntary move we make occurs because of messages transmitted along this pathway. But when motor neurons degenerate in ALS, their ability to transfer messages is disrupted, and that vital signaling system is thrown into chaos. Without their regular cues, the muscles waste away. Precisely what makes the motor neurons degenerate is the prevailing mystery of ALS. In hereditary cases, parents pass genetic mutations onto their children. Even then, ALS involves multiple genes with multiple possible impacts on motor neurons making the precise triggers hard to pinpoint. We're not able to determine which genes in particular, because it's not like we can say, okay, this gene, if this is a mutation, it causes that. There, there could be multiple causes. And, and, and part of our work is using mathematical methods to find out which genes or what places, like, you know, not just, uh, I'm doing Alzheimer's and but I want to do other neurodegenerative diseases. So people are trying so many different approaches to answer these questions. When ALS arises sporadically, the list of possible causes grows. Toxins, viruses, lifestyle, or other environmental factors may all play roles. And if, you, if you've ever heard the fact that your lifestyle may play a role, it's not just because you could damage yourself or maybe hurt a neuron, it's also because of something that's called epigenetics, which we'll talk about. How your environment can shape the way that your genes and your proteins in your cells are expressed, like if you have more of a protein or less of a protein. And because there are so many elements involved, there's currently no single test that can determine whether someone has ALS. Nevertheless, our hypotheses on the causes are developing. One prevailing idea is that certain proteins inside the motor neurons aren't folding correctly and are instead forming clumps the misfolded proteins and clumps may spread from cell to cell. This could be clogging up normal cellular processes. See, sometimes you don't even think about what, why each protein is doing its job, but some, it's sometimes it's the fact that a protein is not doing its job correctly. Like you see, the, it, could, it could be this protein forming clumps instead that can cause this disease. So, um, so this it's forming incorrectly, um, the shape is messed up. So there are all these things on a genetic level. So when I say proteins are super important, they are very, very important for everything. Like energy and protein production, which keep cells alive. We've also learned that along with motor neurons and muscle fibers, ALS could involve other cell types. ALS patients typically have inflammation in their brains and spinal cords. Inflammation. Effective immune cells. The immune system, guys. ...may also play a role in killing motor neurons. And ALS seems to change the behavior of specific cells. And these cells, this, these astrocytes, for instance, we're actually going to talk about these. These are glial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia. These are other cells in the, in the brain that are assisting neurons. ...that provide See? support for neurons. Glial cells. These factors highlight the disease's complexity, but they may also give us a fuller understanding of how it works, opening up new avenues for treatment. And while that may be gradual, we're making progress all the time. We're currently developing new drugs, new stem cell therapies to repair damaged cells. And this, this goes back to what Alex was saying um, before about, um, oh, about how you can go from a stem cell, which is a completely undifferentiated cell. So what a stem cell is, it's like, it could be anything. When we're babies, when we're born, we could be anything, right? And you guys are at that cusp where you're deciding, um, which college you want to go to, what, what thing you want to specialize in, who you want to be, what kind of person you want to be. Um, you know, but when we start off, we, uh, I like to think we all have a blank slate. I'm more of an optimist in that way that we all could be, you know, people are born good. 
So you were deciding. So a stem cell is like the beginning cell. And then when the genes are turned on or turned off, that's what the expression of various genes turns them into neurons, turns them into different types, astrocytes and liquidendrocytes, immune specific immune system cells. Right. So people um, are trying to see how they can reverse engineer as well, get stem cells and then make those stem cells neurons. If neurons are being damaged, can they try to repair that? If they can't figure out a, a cure or a cause, then on a data aspect, if I had data on genes, for instance, of individuals, gene expression data, I remember you guys, um, some of you guys were interested in that. Gene expression data as a computational biologist or a bioinformatician for me, like me, um, slash data scientist, like, you know, I'm, I'm more of a data person, but if I had data on individuals who have the ALS and individuals who don't have it, and I had info on different genes that are being expressed, I could do some analysis to determine, use some machine learning, come up with some way to determine what are some genes that doctors could look at or researchers and screen people and say, okay, well, you are expressing a lot of these five genes. You have a high chance of having ALS or something like that. So that's some of the work that we do. Or we flag down out of over 20,000 genes. Like they can't look at everything. And you were seeing that they were showing the karyotype, all the chromosomes, like multiple spots. But we can give them maybe just 10 genes. Like they can tell, tell the doctors, we think these 10 genes based on our data analysis could be very key. Now, can you do follow-up experiments on those? That's what we would do using data. And um, that's why for me, when I came to Madison, and we can talk about that later, it was super important for me to be able to take some courses in, in biology, because while I could plug and chug in data, I wanted to also have context, because understanding what these are will be really helpful in allowing me to um, be better with my research and be more helpful to the community. Cell therapies to repair damaged cells and new gene therapies to slow the advancement of the disease. With our growing arsenal of knowledge, we look forward to discoveries that can change the future for people living with ALS. So, and I want to give you a little um, aside. So, so there's a lot more um, these protein inclusions as well. That you know, there's a lot more as well that, that behind with these um, you know new degenerative diseases. But this is Stephen Hawking here. So he's really like Westminster Abbey in London is very, very prominent place. So he's really super important. So uh, he's a um, hundred greatest Britons. So he is an English theoretical physicist, cosmologist and author. So he's super important. He was uh, born into Oxford and the family of doctors began here. His work, he, he's really renowned. He was um, the first to set out a theory of cosmology explained by a union of the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. And this is a little bit, um, I feel like as a kind of like a, your instructor and big sister, I feel like I should give this message to you guys. I think this will be a little bit inspirational, something to think about. I fell over and had great difficulty getting up again. This is from Stephen Hawking. Let me put turn on the captions. My mother realized something was wrong and took me to the doctor. I spent weeks in Bart's hospital and had many tests. They never actually told me what was wrong, but I guessed enough to know it was pretty bad. You can see how his hands are quivering. He, is mo he doesn't have much control. There's atrophy. So I didn't want to ask. In fact, the doctor who diagnosed me washed his hands of me and I never saw him again. He felt that there was nothing that could be done. At first I became depressed. I seemed to be getting worse pretty rapidly. There didn't seem any point working on my PhD because I didn't know if I would live long enough to finish it. But then the condition developed more slowly and I began to make progress in my work. However difficult life may seem, it matters that you don't just give up. And there was also a young woman called Jane, whom I had met at a party. Getting engaged lifted my spirits. Every new day became a bonus, and I began to appreciate everything I did have. 
I feel a sense of achievement that I have managed to make these contributions, despite having ALS. I have not allowed my disability to stop me doing most things. My motto is there are no boundaries. When we see the Earth from space, we see ourselves as a whole. We see the unity, and not the divisions. We are here together, and we need to live together, with tolerance and respect. It would be an empty universe indeed, if it were not for the people I love, and who love me. But there are other challenges, other big questions which must be answered. How will we feed an ever-growing population? Provide clean water, generate renewable energy, prevent and cure disease, and slow down global climate change. I don't think we will survive another thousand years without escaping beyond our fragile planet. We must continue to go into space for the future of humanity. We will better understand our place in the universe. So remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Seize the moment. Act now. Be curious. And however difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do, and succeed at. It matters that you don't just give up. While there's life, there is hope. Be brave, be determined, overcome the odds. It can be done. Wow, that was a pretty like inspirational video, right guys? Okay, that's a pretty like a uh, heavy video. It's uh, so don't give up. You know that's like the main. That's the main message from this as well. So this is um. So this is just kind of talking about how each of these neurons in our body is super super important. You know, motor neurons, sensory neurons, and we're gonna talk about the last one, which is interneurons here. So interneurons. So these are neurons found only in the central nervous system and not in the peripheral nervous system. So these are found in the brain and the spinal cord. So they are connecting between the spinal motor and sensory neurons. So actually the way that it works is that these inter, do you guys know what inter means in a way? Do you guys know what inter? Inside. Yeah, inter is inside, right? You said? Oh, oh, yeah. So interneuron is sort of like an in-between. So they're kind of going between the motor neuron and sensory neuron. So it's like an intermediate, like that's how you could remember, like an intermediate, like something that's going in between, inter. That's what in, um, an interneuron is. So they're connecting between the spinal motor and sensory neurons. So they transfer signals between both types of neurons as well as with each other. So interneurons are helping connect motor neurons to sensory neurons and um, also with interneurons and interneurons. So interneurons are connecting with each other so they can, can come up with different circuits of various complexities. So these are different types of neurons and they're just more like a connector. That's what they're doing. Like they're inter So we have these sensory neurons that give signals from sense organs about touch, sight, sounds, um, tastes, smells, the five sense organs. Um, then we have the motor neurons that transmit impulses from the spinal cord to skeletal and smooth muscles. So they're giving us that ability. And ALS, that is, the ability is lost. It's a motor neuron disease. Um, and then the muscles, when they're not used, they begin to atrophy. If you've seen um, like paraplegic people or people who don't have any, like they're paralyzed from certain parts, what happens is those muscles start to atrophy. And instead those paralyzed patients, I've, I've met some of them as well, they have lost the ability in the lower legs and extremities, they cannot move, they're paralyzed. They have some spinal cord injuries. And because of that, like it's very unfortunate, they're not, they're confined to a chair. And the biggest, the things that make them the happiest, it's heartbreaking, is just being able to find a, a, a cushion, like like advancements in developing cushions for wheelchairs. 
But for them, then they, the, the muscles atrophy. So um, that's what motor neuron diseases do. They, they, they disrupt these signals. The muscles are not being used. They atrophy. You saw Stephen Hawking could not even walk properly. And the other theme,